It's the Morning Marketing Machine, here to grow your e-commerce business with proven marketing strategies and tactics, so you can run your business with machine-like precision. My name is Douglas Levin, let's dive in. All right, so welcome to the Morning Marketing Machine. So I'm uh, really excited today because uh, I've been following uh, Norman for a little bit, and uh, I finally got a chance to talk to him uh, and kind of see, see how everything's going with him. And go over mindset and all of the other things that we talk about all the time. Uh, so for people that don't know, uh, Norman Farrar is a serial entrepreneur who provides online marketing and manage e-commerce solutions for brands. Uh, he's worked with Fortune 500 companies such as Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, and 20th Century Fox. Uh, and since the early 90s, uh, he's focused on helping entrepreneurs uh, optimize their operations and unlock their business's potential. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously, like this is more, I guess, in terms of the idea of mindset and, and overcoming obstacles, but it's also obviously for people in e-commerce and, and a lot of people that are either selling on Amazon or looking to diversify and sell on their own websites as well. So um, I guess for those people, like if you can let, let everyone know kind of like how you got to where you are, like a little bit more about your journey. Huh. Tripped on it. Uh, <laughs> I guess so I mean, it, it is actually a complete fluke um, every piece of this so uh, I'll just give you a, a bit of background because it also kind of adds the pieces together for Amazon but back in the 90s I had um, a promotional uh, marketing company and um, anyways one of the companies we were working with it was a fortune 500 company asked uh, if I could do a website and not even knowing what the internet is, I said, yeah, sure, no problem, <laughs> you know, I could do this. <laughs> and so uh, anyways, one company saw it, another company saw it, and all of a sudden I was into, you know, designing these very expensive uh, websites at the time. I mean, back in the day, uh, to just put up a very simple website with hosting was very expensive. But uh, anyways, that kind of led me into one website, led me into my own website, led me into a print-on-demand company, which then uh, I got involved with a, a bunch of other types of business that all added up to Amazon, like uh, warehousing and fulfillment, specialty packaging. Uh, my father and the, my family, we got together and um, we have a, uh, a warehouse or a manufacturing facility in Canada, in the United States, we added two in, uh, in Taiwan, and then uh, presently we have one in China. So the reason for all this is that you kind of combine that all together, it forms Amazon. And so I got into Amazon, and that's where I am today. Awesome. Yeah, I, I know, like, looking at, like, everything that you've been putting out, like, uh, I see, like, the PR stuff, I see, like, all of the branding, like, it seems like you, you're really, like, established a lot. I obviously, like, for everyone that's looking, you can kind of see he's got, I know this guy as well. You've got like a lot of stuff that you've kind of gotten out of all this. Like you seem to be the guy on, on a lot of cool things. Oh, um, you know, it's just been, it's interesting because one of the things I do is I try to be vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm talking to the average person, they say unfocused, but I'm totally focused. And, you know, the companies that, uh, that I have, are kind of they all kind of piece together it's a jigsaw puzzle and when you put it all together um i don't mean this i don't you know no pun intended but a to z um it kind of all fits together you know being vertically integrated is a big part of the way that i do things and so you know you saying that oh you see me doing this or you see me doing that it's all because of this vertical integration to um for me anyways to have the control of the the perceived value of a product you have to know branding which leads to you have to know the package or the product packaging uh, you have to know the types of materials so that you get involved with the sourcing um, to save money and understand the marketplace you have to know a bit about logistics um, again to save money you have to know about the supply chain management and it just goes all the way along the line and if you can control a piece of all of that then um, yeah, you can save a little bit of money. You can get great people to run them. But at the at the end of the day, you got to know a little bit about each each of your businesses that you're running. Well, that, that's really awesome. So, so um, 
I guess before we kind of get to the mindset pieces of it, I know this is obviously we're like, I'll, I know it's still a little bit a ways away, but everyone at this point, if you're doing private label or if you're getting ready, uh, Q4, all that stuff needs to get set up now for your late. Um, so would you have any tips for people that are um, looking like, like to make the best use out of their Q4? Well, at least what I'm telling my clients and what I've heard from um, some experts in the field is if you're not preparing right now, uh, you better be careful. And then the amount, because uh, Prime Day is in October, which this is unheard of, and then you've got Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and then all the gift card sales going through January, uh, it's going to be really weird. So I'm thinking that we need about 300% of what we would normally have ordered for fourth quarter. That's what I'm doing. And if we don't get it, not a big deal. I got inventory. But um, what I'm doing is I'm setting up my inventory a little bit different this year than I did last year. So I've got double the inventory in the warehouse. So warehouse has half, Amazon's got half. I've also made arrangements with my supplier that if I've got, let's say, um, let's say I've got 2,500 pieces here. I've got 2,500 pieces over in China waiting for me to, to grab. So they're already done. They're sitting there. I've either paid nothing or I've paid 30% to keep them there on hold. So once the, um, the, the product in Amazon starts to move, I can take the, the warehousing um, product, ship it over, and then order the other stuff to either come over by air, high-speed vessel, or just regular ocean, depending on the timing. So if I do that, then all I have to do is place another order in with the manufacturer, and guess what? It's just a perfect cycle. So that's one thing I would be definitely doing. I would be managing. I mean, it's all about inventory management right now. If you've got inventory, then you're going to be making the sales. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, like, I know I've heard it, uh, obviously, from you, you were talking about, I've heard it, like, all over the place, the idea that, like, obviously, yes, the virus is, is a big reason why, but um, uh, these are unprecedented times in terms of Prime Day, Black Friday, mm -hmm. Cyber Monday, all of those kinds of things coming at one time and the rise of e-commerce comp even compared to where it was um, because of the virus, like people that have never bought ever before online, a lot of them are now addicted to it or they, they find, they finally find figure out the convenience factor and, yeah. and all the other things that have gone with it. So yeah, you expect that this Q4 is going to be insane compared to everything. Okay. Else. This is how bad it is. <laughs> I'm ordering chocolate bars to the house. <laughs> and I would never have ordered. And now my wife hates me, but <laughs> chocolate bars to the house. So I picked them up. I grabbed them. I'm talking one at a time. I'm not talking. It's crazy. So, um, you know, and if I'm doing that and I can see that the people that were a little bit of afraid of the internet, um, you know, still afraid, don't trust it, but they had to use it. Um, now they've got a bit more of a comfort zone. And you're either buying those low ticket items, like I just said, chocolate bar, or you're buying these really expensive products that you would never have dreamed of. I like a car, mm -hmm. you know, you'd go to a dealership, you negotiate. There's lots of dealings going like dealer car dealers now are having, you know, all sorts of sales online, uh, shoes, all sorts of different things. So I think it's not going to go down. It's just going to go up. So, so I got, I, of course, I got to ask, like, what kind of chocolate bar was it? Kit Kat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was more of a big to good person, but I, I, I definitely liked the Kit Kats when I was, like, a, more of a young person. <laughs> well, we've got a bakery down the street that delivers, too. <laughs> yeah. That was one of my things, like, like uh, but I, I was way overweight. <laughs> I would say, it, like, uh, that was one of the things I gave up was, was, uh, was baked goods to kind of lose, to get where I'm at. But, uh, but anyway, um, so... Um, now we're get, kind of getting into some of the ideas of like, like, all right, so, so many things going on, obviously Q4 going on. So what would you say is, is the most important thing that you're uh, working on right now? For Q4? Uh, just in general, I would say. Oh, just as a business. Yeah. Like, like oh. what is your most important thing? Well, right now, um, we've got a new company that we've launched this year, uh, for sourcing. And we're just trying to get all that in place trying to get the manufacturer's deals cut. Like we're negotiating. So we're trying to negotiate the, these deals with the manufacturers for our clients so they can get 
better pricing and better terms. So if you're asking about the most important thing, I'm looking at terms right now. Uh, problems that you're going to have, especially if you're undercapitalized, uh, is your inventory could kill you. So what we're doing, and, and this isn't a push on my company, but if you're a seller, you should be doing this too. There's no better time than right now to go in and negotiate with your manufacturer. There's hard times in China. Um, you can go in and you can leverage uh, COVID and say how hard it is that, and you can talk about the new restrictions on Amazon, new fees on Amazon, and you need to use marketing dollars that you would normally put into that 30% deposit or the 70 that you'd rather have terms, you know, some, some other form of terms. And it might be, you know, 30 and then 30 days, they might not do it. Maybe it's 20, 20, 60. There, and I have heard that manufacturers are doing that a lot more. We're trying to do um, the, the 30 and then 70 over um, uh, the 30 days uh, terms. And we're getting it. So, and we're asking. So people are saying, oh, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. Ask, you know, and, and if you're not getting it, if you're getting a new, um, if you're trying to find something new, I definitely wouldn't be just going on to Alibaba and doing it, find a sourcing agent and get them to do it because they usually can talk to the people in China in Chinese, not in English, and you could most likely get a better negotiated price for the terms. Yes. All right, so yeah. And that can loosen up your cash flow. You know, if you can get 30 day terms and you're selling a ton on Amazon and you're doing that sort of inventory strategy, I was just saying, that could save your hide. Oh, oh big time. Yeah. And I know it's, it's, it's talked about all the time. You say like, like you, I, I can't remember what the terms I know. I've heard like Carlos and other people say it, like you make your money when you're buying um, that kind of thing. And, and this obviously helps with that in terms of if you can get those rates even better yeah. then because how are you going to kind of get yourself out of that situation if you make a bad um, purchase decision at that point your your cost is way too high and you can't really compete at that point so so definitely that sounds like a great thing to try and work on now uh, so i guess one, one another thing i would kind of say like obviously the, the, this seems like stuff that you kind of love to obviously talk about and, and do in your business so what would you say is like the part of the business that you love the most kind of doing every day I, I like the creative side. So, and I like a challenge. So if somebody shows me a product and oh, if I, if I ever hear this, Oh, we can't go above $10 or we can't, yeah, there's, there's no way you'll be able to get X. That's when I take a product and either try to see if there's some form of product development, like just go on to Amazon, check out the competitors, see what they're doing, read the reviews, ask your manufacturers or anything we can do that the others aren't doing and then make a, make something a bit more innovative than anybody else. Now, if you're stuck and let's say you have a plastic shoe stretcher and there's nothing you can do, you know, you can't, maybe you can change the color. So instead of red, you turn it green. Well, what else can you do? And you know, it's all about packaging and perceived value. So you could put something into a nice, um, uh, container, uh, have a, like when somebody opens it, have a nice message. And now it becomes, you know, something that looks better and has a higher perceived value when the other one comes in a cello pack and, you know, just looks crappy. And, you know, I, I was talking about this the other day. We did this with um, like a kitchen product where the cost was 16, uh, launched at 49, um, the ceiling at the time we thought was around 79 ish. Uh, we got it up to 97, which was, you know, really great. Then we hit 124. And just before we got on the call, uh, we were talking about the new package that we have, which caused the product to go to 224. Oh, wow. Three, $3 more. Uh -huh. Okay. 224. So $16, 224. And, units are selling like i just got off the phone with the the person who looks over that uh product mm -hmm. and we, we're just looking over the 30 days and yeah we were really happy with the results yeah well and that, that gets back to the idea like um from like the marketing side of it like looking at it, it's like it's really always about status right the idea of like it's it, like I, I i'm sure if you know like russell brunson he talks about the idea of like is it a status increase or status decrease right and it kind of sounds like what you're saying is is 
um, really like if you're looking at like say a Gucci bag or something like that, those things are, are what like five, 10 bucks or at most to make in uh, even if that, and then you're selling, you're seeing them sell for what thousands of dollars, right? Because they want that because obviously what, for whatever reason, the status to have that is there. It sounds like you guys have done something in terms of what you get, like that packaging and the other branding parts of it, where you set up the, that, that status increase. So now you can go above that threshold to go to 200 bucks like that, which is. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you another good example. Hopefully it's here right here. Okay. I ordered three beard combs. Okay. So they all came in at the same time. This beard comb was 79 cents. Okay. I don't know how, I don't know why it was 79 cents. I bought it on Amazon. It came in a cello pack. I brought another one that had a vinyl pouch and it came in a box. It was 11 something. And then I got one that I could put a credit card in. It was in a really nice box and it was 1785. This sold nothing. Okay. The one that I'm holding in my hand sold zero. Like there, you couldn't, there was no real uh, numbers, no data. The other one sold 3000, the highest priced one sold 15,000. So all about perception. And I would have bought that $17 one. I was just doing it for a podcast. Like I wanted to show the perception and um, I would have bought it all day long. So yesterday, my dog ate this, ate this, and I had to go and find another. This happened yesterday. So it's just funny talking about it, but I looked for these combs and now Check it out, beard comb, sandalwood. These are 35 cents. And now everybody's gonna do it. But I checked it out with the manufacturer, the ones that I found anyways. I saw some for $25 that are all in a nice box. And maybe they heard me talking about it because there's a whole bunch of them now in really nice boxes, very expensive. And then the same thing with the comb. I actually saw one of these, which cost nothing, for over a hundred dollars, 127 bucks. Mm -hmm. And all they're doing is changing the wood a little bit, putting a finer finish on it and just cleaning it up a bit. The small details, mm -hmm. you can ask a manufacturer to do stuff like that. It costs nothing. Yeah. yeah. And, and obviously it helps differentiate your product too from all of those other. That's it. Out there, right? Yep. That's it. Yeah. So I guess I'll kind of switch track a little bit here. So obviously they think those are the part of the business that you love. So what would you say the part of the business is that you love the least? Oh God, I hate accounting. I know <laughs> accounting. If you don't know your numbers, you're dead. But you know, so you can go to, and, and this is the reason I'm saying this because I absolutely hate it. I don't want to talk about it. I have accountants to do my stuff. So, and bookkeepers, they keep everything straight. So I don't have to worry about it, but um, you do have to keep track of it. Doesn't mean because you hate it, you don't understand it. So, one of the things that um, I was able to do is kind of like a uh, reader's digest, but um, I, Tim Ferriss has a, uh, 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 or Francis has a course knowing your numbers. Mm -hmm. So go to it, you know, know your numbers. It's, it's like 400 bucks and you can go to a course like that. You can get it online and it's just the basics of what you need to know to operate your business. So you can make, you know, informed decisions and there's, you know what? And I hope they're not listening. Um, <laughs> I have a company that I, um, I work with. They're over $10 million uh, in Amazon sales. And we took them on and we looked at their product and they thought they were doing really great. They were um, ASM winners. You know, they, they, they were able to just get in there and sell anything and make a gazillion. Well, I looked at their product and it was, um, it was a disaster they were losing a hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow. $10 million company losing a hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm amazed that they're even in business. Yeah. <laughs> they keep it going like that. Yeah. So anyways, with a few changes, uh, everything's turned around. Uh, they're making money and they're, they're making some pretty good money like they should. But um, there's, a, there's so many small things that uh, you can do with your numbers to really gain, you know, those extra points that, you know, that puts money in your jeans at the end of the day. But yeah, I have to say that's probably something I really don't like doing at all. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I, I think it's one of the things that I probably tried to outsource as quickly as I could. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know many people that really like dealing with that in general. <laughs> but um, so, so another question I want to ask you is like, cause obviously you've got a whole bunch of different things that you're working on here is um, how, like, how do you get the most out of your day when you've got all of those things to do? Oh, okay. So I should, this is one thing I can really say that I'm pretty good at. And it's not the day, it's the night before. So um, I've taken time management courses. I've uh, gone through the E-Myth and E-Myth Academy, I like systemizing everything. So one of the ways that I get things done is, first of all, I hire really great people and they get great. They get those things done. All I do really is, you know, find those great people to delegate to other people. And we have a system on how to do it. So that's the first thing. But for me, for my day, uh, I usually take 20 minutes to a half hour at the end of every night and I'll just plan it out. Now things come up every day, but like in the morning, things are off. Uh, everything is off. I, and when I do take these blocks of time, um, everything is off. Email is off, Skype is off, all channels are off. Oh, and by the way, you, if you wanna, one way to help um, funnel the communication. There's a product called Franz and it takes all of your communication channels and puts it into one app. So that's one way that it, it, you know, not going from app to app to app to app, looking all over the place. But the way that I start the day is everything's off. I, um, I take a look at my priorities. So my priority one, I get that done out of the way. Next step, if there's a, a meeting or anything like that, it's slotted in. I definitely have a time, like I slot in time to um, check my mail, email, and then uh, I'll do A, Bs, and, uh, sorry, my Bs and Cs. So if I've got a bunch of Bs or a bunch of Cs tasks that I want to get out of the way, one, two, three, really quick, I'll slot in, you know, a half hour to do that. And then, you know, let's say it's lunch, and then I go back to whatever's priority. But one of the things that I learned a long time ago is get the priority things done out of the way. You know, and th then you can plan you know, plan your day. But if you don't have silence, um, and if you if you can't tune out, there's just all this other stuff that fogs your head. And you know, oh, Skype bell just went off. Facebook just went off. This went off. Oh, LinkedIn. You'll never get anything done, especially if you're. Let's say you're working on, like I said, a, a proposal, right? Well. You're it's so working on a proposal. Everything is off. I'm not, I'm, I'm working on that, getting that out of the way. And then, um, you know, then on to the next thing. So that's the thing I use, um, freedom.io to turn off everything. Mm -hmm. And I use, um, sometimes, especially at night, um, brain.fm, uh, very inexpensive. And it, what it does is it allows you to either focus. It does allow you to sleep too. So with wireless um, uh, headphones, it works. So, you know, kind of restless once in a while, I'll throw those in, listen to uh, brain.fm and yeah, it works like a charm. But that's kind of my, like, my best kept secret is the way I organize. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, a lot of the stuff that I've tried to do as well. Like, um, are you familiar with um, uh, the one thing from Gary Keller? And um, I think it's uh, Deep Work as well, like those books at all? No, no. Okay. Um, it sounds like it's similar to what you, you guys are doing. Like, so, so one thing is basically the same thing in terms of, and, and that and a combination of ultimate sales machine, which I got, I got this from Brian Bowman, like he's one of my mentors. And um, it's the same idea. Like you basically plan out, say your week and then the, the night before you plan out the next day, same kind of thing as you're doing, you make the number one priority your first thing you do, and then you just go down the list. So it sounds like it's, it's kind of something similar to what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's really cool. Yeah. The one other thing that you can do, uh, and if you don't do it, uh, you know, check it out, just clean your desk. So if you've got filing or if you've got papers or if you've got whatever, just clean it off and start fresh. Um, that is a, if you've got a stack of papers that you know you got to get to, that's a stress point. If you've got stuff all over your desk, that's a stress point. Clean it, you know, have your Zen moment. Start of the day, it's nice and clean. Yeah, definitely. And that gets obviously get into the mindset. It's a small thing, but I mean, it helps, right? Like, like you want to, 
it, it gets back to the idea of, of like just your mindset in general, like the whole po- positive mindset versus negative mindset. It's a small win, but it's still something that gets you started off on the right foot. It's the um, small wins that make it. Oh, yeah. So, so since I was at, uh, talking a little bit about books, I would say like, so what's um, the current book that you're reading and like say like your favorite book in the last say six months? Okay. So I was just going, you know what? People are asking me about my bloody books. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I, I just have four here that I really like to talk about. They're not big reads. They're not going to be Pulitzer Prizers, but what I, uh, what I have is um, like a, this is one you got to take a look at. Um, and it's uh, Michael Gerber, uh, The E-Myth Revisited. And if you want to go one step further, um, they have uh, the E-Myth Academy, which allows you to really you know, understand your, um, how to build a performance-based culture, understand how to build your brand and live your brand, and then systemize everything. And I can't tell you, I mean, it, it, it really did change my life. If I didn't systemize it, I could never do what I'm doing now because it's so easy just to, oh yeah, okay, this is what it is. It's not an SOP. It's a policy and procedure. So you're defining everything, you, you know, all, all the roles. So everybody knows what's going on. Uh, anyways, all the prerequisites, the SOP is just a part of it. But E-Myth re, um, Revised or Revisited, uh, it's a great book. Now, um, one that I, uh, I, that I was just talking about was The Four Agreements. Not a business book. It could be a business book. But it's by um, an author called Don Miguel Ruiz. And it's, uh, it's based on, uh, well, so I'm told, ancient Taltec wisdom. And it's based on four things. Uh, be, pe- be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make any assumptions and always do your best. Those are, you know, you can apply them to life. You can apply them to, you know, your family, uh, going out and having a holiday, business, you know, just in general. But there are two that I love um, having people buy in. Like I, if, if I've, I made a mistake earlier on is I would tell people what I think the company should be. Okay. So it was top down and there was really no buy-in. It's okay. This is the culture of the company. This is what we're going to do. This is, you know, and who's going to buy into that? I'm just like a heavyweight just saying, this is what we believe in. Mm -hmm. So these two books really help change that where you get the buy-in of the whole company, not only the company, but you get the buy-in of the consumer. So the first one is uh, Raving Fans. And this is about really great customer service. How do you do it? And you know, how do you apply it? He's got some great tips in there and any of these tips will help out. But all it is, is being impeccable with that. And if you hear any of these um, courses, you know, some of the big courses that are out there, they all talk about that. If you are, as long as it's not a fake review, but if, if you go and you, you know, give them the refund regardless, get on it, talk to people and just say, hey, you know, oh, maybe like for me, I sell some soap. Maybe they don't like the scent of the soap. It doesn't mean they hate my product, but they didn't like the scent. Okay, let's establish that. Let's turn it around. Let's send them some, you know, or what other product do you want? I sell this, this and this. You know, and, and then try to try to make it right for them. So then you see that one star turn into a three star, or four star, or five star. But there's all sorts of different things that you can do to build um, a, a really loyal customer base. And then this is it's by Ken Blanchard, but he also wrote one um, called Gung Ho, and Gung Ho brings together the spirit basically of three different animals, the squirrel, the beaver, and the goose. And they, he just talks about um, how the squirrel works to make sure that he's got everything prepared for winter. So it's just preparing the business, making sure that your um, framework is in place. And then the way of the, 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 the beaver is to achieve the goal. He's building the dam. Well, he's got to do step one, two, three, four, five. So those are your processes. And then, the goose, the gift of the goose. 
And that's just basically like goose do when they're flying, when they're migrating, it's cheering each other on, the back comes up to the front. So it's just learning how to work together as a team. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I know I'd heard of the E-Myth, I think for years in terms yeah. of that. And I, and I hadn't heard that analogy in terms of like goose and squirrel, like, like uh, that, I, obviously like you can kind of see where they're going with it without like, it, I haven't read those books, but that seems like a really interesting way to do it. And now I'm interested to read them. Yeah, and they're not thick reads. Like they're, they're. I mean, it's just a, a quick read that you go, wow, I can apply this very easily. Awesome. Um, so I guess another question that I know like I've dealt with in the past and I know a lot of people do as well is, is the idea of like, like there, there's, it's not always going to be perfect. There's always going to be stuff that comes up. There's going to be stumbling blocks along the way. Um, maybe your mind's just not right for whatever reason. So what have you done? Like say either if you're in a funk or you just have some obstacle, you just can't get past um, like, like in the past, like what have you done to try and get past those and what has worked for you best? Well, um, I think that uh, I always, I, it, for me, I've been, the first time I get kicked in between the legs, it hurts and you don't want to get up. When you get your 10th, 12th, 100th time, you know it's going to hurt, but you get up, you know. And I, I think that the best thing to advise people that get into that kind of funk, especially if, they're, like right now, they might be out of a job, um, it seems hopeless, or it just might be that uh, you're not sure if this is the right career path. Well, don't stress out about it. Uh, first of all, um, it's never as bad as it's going to seem. I've, I've, I've lived my life. I've had tons of failures. It's never as bad as it's going to seem. And then the second thing is 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, what you were stressing about is just going to wipe off your shoulders. You don't even have to worry about it. You'll lose no sleep. So what I had literally bleeding ulcers when I was 20, in my late 20s, I'm looking at now going, I don't even think I would have batted an eyelash. I can go to sleep. I'm not worried about this, 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 and this. So that's, that's one thing, like, just don't, it's the stress part, you know, when you're, when you're an entrepreneur. Um, the other thing, uh, I, you know, I, I like telling entrepreneurs, especially um, people that just have some successes and they get really cocky and all of a sudden they have a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are the people that I find sometimes that are the hardest to bounce back. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to do because, you know, you're like, just recently I met a guy that um, had a good sized business. He got hit with some things out of his control. And now he became very humble. All those cars, the house, it's all gone. But now he can come back and um, I think he's going to be a really great entrepreneur because he's got all the talent, but he just had to get rid of the shining paycheck and Lamborghinis and stuff like that. <laughs> Nobody's interested in that stuff, no. but you know, and so, yeah, if I get out of the funk, you know, like I could go for a walk, uh, you know, to, I mean, right now it's beautiful. Like uh, I'm right at the beach so I can go outside and I can go for a walk and it's beautiful. So that's, in my case, that's what I like to do. Yeah, I know, I've definitely heard that from a few people as well. Like, obviously we're in Illinois, so now it's nice, but um, in the winter, winter, it gets to be a little difficult. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so, so this brings me to another point um, in terms of, obviously we're business owners, we're entrepreneurs, and, uh, really it all comes down to the idea of like, why are you doing this? Right. Like, like what is going to make you go through those struggles that you were saying? Um, and like you were, you were giving the example before of the person who was humble. So like, what, like do you have a purpose like for why you're doing this and like, what, what's your purpose? Okay. You know, uh, it, 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 why an entrepreneur? Um, like it's, it's very strange, but entrepreneurs at least a lot of the entrepreneurs that i know i know i can never and my whole life never work for somebody i've worked for somebody on a very short period of time 
but I've always been like right back to high school, you know, having a rock promotion company, then doing something else and having a video company and then doing, you know, I could never, I don't know. It's an adrenaline, adrenaline thing, especially starting companies. I love starting companies. I think I'm addicted to it, but um, it's a, it, it's just something in the pit of your stomach that you, this is your calling. And, you know, some people are a welder, some people, you know, I, I don't know, you know, lifeguards, it's their calling. Um, this is what I like doing, but you know, there's risk and all of everything could be wiped out if it's not properly handled. Right. So um, that's the other thing with being an entrepreneur is that uh, there's a ton of risk. You know, like when, I, um, when I'm 65 here in Canada, nobody's going to take care of me. I don't get, you know, pension. I don't get, uh, like right now, this COVID thing. My wife gets um, unemployment. I don't get anything. I got to make it my own. So, you know, you've got to be able to be that type of person to, um, to just do it. And, you know, j just to establish something. Like during COVID, um, we started two businesses, a podcast and another podcast on top of everything else. <laughs> so it's great. You know, we were able to come up with some stuff and we, we laid down the ground rules and off we went. So I think I answered the question, but I think I might've uh, been more politician on that. What was the <laughs> question? <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. I was asking about purpose, but I think you gave an answer there. <laughs> My, my, you know, the perp, the, my purpose in life is, it is really like, I just want to live a good life, you know, and I don't want to stress out people. I hate confrontation. Um, where I am, like, this is a, I don't have to worry about jerks as clients. If I don't like them, I just let them go very gently. So I, I don't know. I, my purpose is, you know, working with my family, developing my, being around my family, having, you know, great things in life, building great things. And, you know, just, I, I try to be a nice guy. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. I, I know. Um, uh, this kind of gets back to like, like, like one of the things that I, I, like I read a lot now as well. So like, uh, um, one, one of the books I just read was the 12 week year. And mm -hmm. this kind of came at it a different perspective than I think I had done like the entire time I've been in business. Like the idea is, is you're supposed to look at it from a perspective. What's, what do you want your life to look like? Not what do you want your business to look like? And then your business should um, be congruent with that at that point, not the other way around. Yeah. Uh, so that's where you're saying like, obviously like you don't have to take on clients that you don't want to, or what makes it so that it works out for you. Like that gets into like your vision. Like what do you want your, what is going to make for a happy and content life for you, right? Versus, uh, like, I know I've done in the past, and I assume a lot of people have too. Like, you feel like, I got to keep working. I got to keep working. I got to, like, nose to the grindstone, um, work, like, 20 hours a day kind of thing. And then you're just neglecting your family. You're neg neglecting all of these other things yeah. that you should be doing, right? And, you know, I, 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 like many entrepreneurs, I think I fell into that, you know, workaholic. Um, you know, you get addicted, you really do, you can get addicted to work. Um, and it takes, you know, stepping back, like you said, and, you know, kind of planning that out. But what's really nice, E-Myth again, I'm going to go back to that, is um, I had a, a fairly substantial promotions company, which there was a lot of moving parts, and there was tons of salespeople, and there was just, you know, it's, it was, a, it was just mayhem. But because of the systems and because of the people I had, I could go for a month holiday and not call, you know, a, a, and it wasn't like, Oh, once a year, I could go for a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there, take a full month off. Um, now I want it to get to this point, but when you start a company, like one of the things you got to do is jump in with two feet. And so if, you know, I, I work, early mornings, late nights, trying to develop different systems for the different companies. But once they're all kind of working together, then I'm going to take some time and enjoy myself a little bit more, but you got to do it. Like, and like you said, you can schedule out, ah, I'm going to go and do this. I'm going to go over to LA for a few days. Uh, I'm going to take the family on a cruise. Um, you know, it's, it's nice life when you, you know, entrepreneurs are either going to have an incredible nice life, or it's a little rocky, but 
the trick is finding the balance, you know, where is that risk reward? Mm -hmm. Very, very true. Yes. And uh, this gets back in, into another question too. Like obviously we were talking about like, why are you doing this? Right. So, so like, I guess I'm going to ask you then like, so what is a work life balance then to you? <laughs> oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> so I, I tell you my, my enjoyment, I take one break a day. Mm -hmm. So I am not, I am, uh, especially right now, we, we, I have a bunch of things on the go. So mm -hmm. I'm up in the morning, I'm doing my thing. I have like on Mondays, I have all my staff meetings. Um, but throughout the, throughout the day, except at around this time period, mm -hmm. I'll go out on the patio and I'll have a cigar. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go and eat dinner and then I come back down here. Now, unfortunately, because of everything that's going on, that's seven days a week and has been for about three or four months. But at the end of, like under a normal circumstances when things are going really nice or when somebody buys your business, that's a whole different story. But typically I, um, I probably, I'm a night owl. So uh, I'll stay up. And I think this is more because of China, but I'll stay up till... I usually go to bed around two and you know, then I'll get up around eight ish. Uh, some of like what I like to be able to do and what I do under normal circumstances, like last year, I would go out, I would have a coffee. I would sit there for an hour or two and, you know, do some reading or do whatever, then go down start doing my work. And uh, again, if you have good people, everything's in place. I get the reports from the night before I can take a look at them and just, you know, go on with my day. Oh, you're asking the wrong guy right now about how do you plan? Yeah. Hey, hey, you figure what Q4 and other stuff going on, right? A lot of people at this point are, are, are hustling right now. So, yeah. so yeah, it makes sense. Huh? Yeah. And I've read, you know, the four hour work week mm -hmm. and I love it. But there's, I, you can't, if I got down to the four hour work week, mm -hmm. I would be, oh, I got to do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I don't think I look at it from that perspective. I look at it from... All right. Um, I, like I, actually, I was just talking to Liron uh, Hirschhorn about this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like on last week's show, and um, he was he was bringing up the idea of, of like, basically like uh, wherever you are is like your is is you, where you are, and that you're putting all your attention to it. So I I, I think what what I've been trying to do like more lately because I I admit I suck at a work life balance, and um, uh, but the idea that whenever it is that you're doing whatever it is. So like, if you're at work, then you're at work. And like, you're like, like you were saying with the, with the no distractions, same thing where like, I'm going all in during the hours that I'm working. But then if I'm going to end my day at say uh, five or six o'clock, if, if I'm going to make time for family and that's part of what I want to do once five or six o'clock hits, then I don't care. My business is dead to me <laughs> as much as I can, because I, I got to be there for my family at that point, if I'm going to have it, or if you got, say I, I got a launch or Q4, I know that for say, I don't know, two weeks or whatever it's going to be that I've got that period of time where I really have to go all in on the business. Okay. That's what it's going to be. But then I'm going to counterbalance that with, I don't know, a couple of weeks where I'm going to just be taking time away from the business. And yeah. like, like when it's all like say Q1, when you're you're cutting all your money right from Q4, um, so that you can take time with your family and and give them the memories that hopefully they'll have when they're older and all of those other things. So just kind of like counterbalance balancing it as much as you can, I guess. Well, one of the things that um, I, I yeah I have to say used to because it's been so many months back now, but when we would go out, uh, I would make sure the phone is off, mm -hmm. you know, and and that way if we're either uh, out at dinner doing something at night. Uh, you know, heading out to Toronto, doing whatever, there is nobody can get a hold of me. So, I mean, even if it was urgent, unfortunately, but I, it's off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I turn it on either the next day or, you know, there's very, very seldom that you'll see an urgent call that came through that you missed. Um, it's usually 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah, it's, you know, just people that we're going to chat. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So, so as, as we're kind of wrapping up here, um, I guess one question that I, I, I usually want to kind of ask, and sometimes I forget, but uh, so what's your definition of success? My definition of success is, you know, just feeling, probably just feeling at peace, 
feeling that you've given back, feeling that, you know, you've got a, um, like a, a healthy life. Um, you know, it's just at peace with yourself. Uh, you know, that's it. I mean, money is one thing and you hear that all the time, but money is one thing, you know, it's, I believe me, I've lost it. I got it back. I lost it. I got it back. Um, so when you do that, by the way, uh, you learn that there's so many other things that are more important than just the money. If you're chasing the money, I don't know if that's success. Like money comes with, you know, with your passion. So I just think, uh, yeah, for success for me, if, if my ha- if my family, if my kids, if I am, uh, at peace, we have fun, we can do things together. I'm successful. Nice, nice. That, that is a great way, great thought way to think of it. I, I love that. Um, so, so as we're kind of finishing up here, so like, so what's the best way if someone wants to get a hold of you um, that, uh, and kind of learn more about what you do to contact you? Well, sure. Um, you can reach me at norm at AMZ. So like Amazon, amz.club. Uh, you can check out if you're ever interested in content or press releases, prreach.com to ours. Um, Honu Worldwide is the sourcing company. And like you said at the beginning, I Know This Guy is a podcast I put together. It's 100% non e com. It's about interesting people, um, their life struggles, uh, how they got around them. Uh, so check that out. It's on Apple or any of your favorite uh, podcast platforms. And, or just email me at the email address that I gave. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on, Norm. It was, it was so fun to talk to you about this. And uh, for everyone that's listening, uh, uh, listen to what he says. Get your stuff done for Q4. And um, I'll talk to you guys on the next episode. All right. All right. See you guys. See you later.